Hi, the purpose of this presentation is to address a couple commonly held misconceptions about how we read words. Mainly the misconceptions uh, that when we read it's a visual task in which we have to learn words by memorization. Okay, and then that we would have to retrieve them from visual memory. So this is mostly going to be framed according to what skilled readers seem like they do when they read words so accurately and automatically. And I'm going to present some of the evidence, some of the experiments um, which have dispelled misconceptions of reading as a visual, as a visually driven process. Okay. Ah, before we begin, these two texts shown here are my two favorites when it comes to understanding how reading occurs <clears throat> and what takes place when there's difficulty. Some of the material um, in this presentation I'm going to credit to these amazing authors and I highly recommend that anyone who wants to build their professional library, any literacy professional's library, um, these would be great for it. So one is a classic cited in the majority of research, probably in everything, uh, regarding word reading and another <clears throat> is a new and very highly popular um, text on how reading occurs. They are must-reads. So, all right, let's move on. There's a very common misconception in education that when we read, we read words as whole units using visual memory. And it's believed that when we see the word apple, we're able to say apple by virtue of seeing it just like it's a picture there, just like we would point to a giraffe, a picture of a giraffe and say giraffe. In actuality, who does this? Well, early beginner readers do this. They have to depend on shapes and forms as do baboons. So um, I just want to stop and talk a bit about French researchers who did a paper in 2012, a study, and in it the baboons entered these enclosures voluntarily and inside there were these screens that flashed four-letter words like done or vast and then some non-words like dran or ver. And notice that those words are similarly shaped visually. Um, both start with a tall curvy D or a pointy V, um, and then they have same sized letters after them. The baboon had to touch one of two different colored shapes on the screen when they saw one word. One shape would say indicate a real word and one was for not a real word. And if they got the right answer, they earned a tasty reward. So this is kind of remarkable because, again, the nonsense words and non-words were very similar in appearance to the, actual, or to the real words. And obviously the baboons weren't reading and attending to meaning, but they were just memor... And, then, and they weren't just memorizing that vert, V-I-R-T, required hitting the blue oval to get a food prize either. They were actually making choices based on the fact that their brains were being wired to recognize letter combinations, letters next to each other within the words. So it started out with trial and error <clears throat> and their brains had to learn to tell real words from nonsense words by recognizing these combinations that are frequent and likely in real words and then make their choices accordingly. So they were actually gleaning the rules of English without any knowledge of the language itself and they didn't have to understand any sounds and they didn't have to decode which they couldn't do anyway and they only had to look at say the word wasp and notice the features in it. So a capital A has that crossbar and the side leg and then they would see that next to the squiggly S and you know hit the button and get rewarded to say yeah that's a acceptable combination in English. And you know they even did a similar study with pigeons. But what about this cute baby there, this human? Is she really read, reading the word banana? No. She's seeing a tall letter of the B and then a series of lumpy bumpy low letters after it. Chances are that in that set of word cards made by her mom or whomever, there are no other words that look like banana. So that word is a picture for her, and it means that yellow thing she's going to eat for lunch. If we were to change that word to damana, she's still going to say banana. She's not using letter sounds yet because she knows she, well, she doesn't have letter sounds yet. She has to read by shape and by visual memory. And the truth is, again, that skilled readers like you and me, uh, we don't have to read the thousands and thousands of words that we know as whole units. Reading does not depend on our eyes seeing a whole word and then pulling it from memory. Um, so for this presentation, 
Um, I want to say we are going to use the word skilled reader to refer to someone who has learned to read well. We can decode, we can comprehend what we read. And so anyone who wouldn't fall under this umbrella term would be infants, very young children, new readers who are still in the beginning stages of reading, older students, adolescents or adults even who have difficulty reading for any variety of reasons, including dyslexia, you name it. Okay, so that being said, in the field of reading education, many of our techniques and methods for instruction have come about based on this, how it seems we read. Well, it seems we read words as whole units, as pictures, so therefore the reasoning has been that we should instruct that way as well. And I'm sure you can tell that this presentation is going to show you some of the evidence from research uh, that skilled readers do not read words as whole units based on visual memory. That's not how we became skilled readers, and that's not how we can best teach our students to do so, to become good readers. Okay, so, um, and I think this is important to know because instruction focusing on memorizing words as whole units is not evidence-based instruction, and there's a much better way but first we need to dispel the myth and the misconception that we read like things like the words are pictures. All right, so evidence-based instruction comes from many, many disciplines. Psychologists, lots of different kinds of psychologists, developmental psychologists, child psychologists, educational psychologists, experimental psychologists, oh, neuropsychologists, linguists, psycholinguists, school, did I say school psychologists? Uh, speech and language pathologists, um, and then we go to optometrists, ophthalmologists, medical fields, neurology, um, and of course education, both regular and special ed, and many more. So out of all of these fields studying reading, the consensus is that skilled readers don't read words based on familiarity with its shape and how it looks. And the consensus is that we shouldn't teach that way, but that's going to be for another presentation altogether. So why do researchers um, bother studying skilled readers if they can already read so well? It's kind of weird. So number one, they need to research the processes that take place when a skilled reader reads in order to, number two, understand reading difficulty and what's happening when reading is delayed or doesn't progress so that we can then, three, prevent or remediate reading difficulty using evidence-based instruction. So we need to understand what's happening in skilled readers to understand what's not going right and, and fix it. Okay, so the next slide. Uh, take a moment to appreciate really how amazing reading is. You're likely one of the skilled, competent readers we're referring to here. And to see how quickly you can read, try one or both of these sites to see. Uh, quick reading, by the way, is is an ability we have only when we can read most words of, in a text without any effort, when reading is easy. So this is really why we care about speed or fluency, <clears throat> not because speed is important, but because speed is a really valid indicator telling us, hey, this person's a good word reader. It's easy. Words are just coming off the page for you, easy as can be, and you'll be able to read a text quickly, um, just as a quick or fluent typist is quick because the finger placement and muscle memory is very automatic for them. Um, you can look at the presentation in this series on fluency to read more about this or to learn more about it. So stop the presentation now and see how quickly you um, can read. You can type into Google Staples what speed do you read and hopefully it'll take you to the staples.com website page that will have a passage and you can learn how many words per minute uh, words you can read per minute correctly. And the other site here, spritzinc.com, is fascinating. You read words not left to right, but one on top of another. <clears throat> so the words just kind of scroll, and you keep your eye in one spot. And you can, if you practice, you can get up to 750 words a minute because you're not having to take up valuable time moving your eyes from one word to the next. Really fascinating. So enjoy that for a few minutes if you want to stop, and then I'll meet you on the next slide. All right, so how did you do? The benchmark for 6th, 7th, and 8th graders is approximately 150 words per minute. 
Many can read more than that and many don't come close to that, but you probably did come close or even bypass the average adult rate of sometimes 300 words a minute. <clears throat> and this, of course, is going to depend on what we're reading, right? So something written by Dr. Seuss is going to be read much more quickly and easily than a medical journal. But how on earth do you read hundreds of words a minute and many words per second? <clears throat> In 1938, um, a researcher named Woodworth found that we can read 12 to 15 words in a tenth of a second. I mean, this is just amazing. I'm sure it does seem like we're reading those words as, as units, recognized because we memorize them as a whole picture, as a chunk um, that you've become familiar with. But, mm -mm. so, let's see, it's not what it seems. Studies of skilled readers show that they don't need to slow down deliberately to, to decode the sounds. They don't have to figure it out. They don't have to apply word attack skills. They need a mere visual glance to say the word. And of course, no wonder we think we're just merely memorizing a sequence of units, right? It absolutely, understandably does seem like skilled readers don't give these letters any attention in words. But experiments show they actually do, and we're going to touch on that in a bit. So, as skilled readers, we recognize things, boom, automatically as a unit. We don't pay attention, it seems, to the individual letters, and we're able to recognize them automatically on sight. Um, two things uh, to keep in mind. That the beginning or struggling readers could not do this task you're about to do. I'm going to have you do something in the next slides. Only skilled readers can do it, so you'll be able to do it. And rapid and effortless word recognition, knowing a lot of words by sight, is the hallmark of fluent reading, which is why fluency is such a strong predictor of reading achievement. Okay, um, on the next slide, <clears throat> I'm going to flash a word for six tenths of a second. Try to read it. How'd you do? Did you read the word strip? I'm sure most of you did. <clears throat> it's likely that it just popped off the page, boom, in parts of a second. It's likely that it's a word that's impossible to suppress reading whenever you see it. Strip, strips, sunset strip, strip steak. Um, so this is a, a sight word for you. That's a term to refer to a word um, that you can recognize on sight. It's not used to represent a word that's irregularly spelled on a word wall. It's not a tricky word. It's not one that just has to be memorized. But any kind of word can be a sight word. Any word at all can be one that we just recognize with a glance. Um, it can be regularly spelled, like cat. It can be an irregularly spelled rule breaker, like wood. It can be a frequent word or an infrequent word. So what strategy did you, as a skilled reader, need to use strip? None. It was automatic. You didn't need to use a strategy. It's a sight word for you. So let's try the next one. Okay. How'd you do this time? Did you get it? This was the word trips, in case you missed it. And hmm, the letters in trips are the same exact letters that were on the word strip. But you recognized that when the letters are in this particular order, it's a different word altogether. So this is also a sight word for you. Next one. Hmm. Now we have different letters, and the word is wrought, like in wrought iron. Hopefully you got it. This is not a regularly spelled word like trips and strip were. We have the WR representing the er sound, and four letters, O-U-G-H, representing the aw sound. And yet you read the three sounds of this word, er, ought instantaneously, even though it's not something you read every day in print. It's kind of a rare word, it's an irregularly spelled word, but you read it instantaneously. You can read it on sight. It became a sight word for you. I bet you no teacher ever sat you down and taught you that that word's a, the word rot, but somehow it became one for you. Okay, next one. Recognition involves the correct pronunciation. Yep. So here we have a word that may not be a sight word for all of you. Some of you might have known this word and read it and pronounced it inside your head as epitome. Others might have said hesitant, hesitantly epitome. You may not have ever seen that word in print before. You probably heard of it. 
the epitome of this or the epitome of that, but you never saw it in print. So maybe you didn't get this one. So what's a sight word for me might not be a sight word for you. So it's not a quality or an aspect of the words, it's a characteristic of your interaction with a word that determines whether it pops off as a sight word for you. Epitome is longer, it's more complicated, it's rare, and it might not be a part of everyone's sight word bank. We call it a sight word bank. For some of us, it is. And if it's a sight word for you, you can recognize it in a sixth of a second. Seems like you're just using visual memory, right? Okay, last one. Ah, what did your mind tell you about this one? A lot of consonants, right? Isn't even a word. Your mind tells you, I don't think that's a word. There's no way you can recognize it as an entire unit of letters that go together in any meaningful way that you recognize. It's completely meaningless. It's not a sight word for any of us. So, at least not in English, that's for sure. All right. So now let's consider a single word. Say the word particle and consider the differences between how a skilled reader recognizes it and how a beginning or struggling reader does so. So a skilled reader has to sub can subconsciously read it as a glance, less than one tenth of a second. And a beginning or strugg struggling reader, excuse me, has to consciously sound it out, use common spelling patterns or recognizable patterns within it, or use it an analogy to a word they already know, like the word article or part. Um, B and C are common methods of instructing students, um, guessing, and we'll come more back to this a little bit later. All right, so notice what kind of attention you have to pay when you're reading different sets of words. We're going to do this next. One set are going to be sight words for you, but the others won't be, so you'll have to be a little deliberate in reading some of these. All right, these are nonsense words, certainly not sight words for you, what, but you read them all. If we were all here together, we'd read them in unison and we'd get them all, we'd be saying the same things. Most people will say, when I say, how'd you read them, they'll say, I chunked them. You had to consciously decode them and you probably did it by reading the chunks, kish, min, poil, or plin, figgle, donk. <laughs> Um, so you chunk the syllables, and if you want to see more about how the brain knows where to chunk, see the presentation on syllable patterns coming up. All right. So to read the next slide of nonsense words, also not nonsense, or also not sight words for you, you now used a strategy of seeing a common spelling pattern. In this case, they all end in ack, so you just read down the line. Uh, but again, that was a little bit of a conscious strategy. What are these? Oh, I, your brain saw it and made a decision how to read these. All right, slide 17. What's different here? Well, uh, these are obviously real words, but the point in including them is that you needed no strategy to read them, no conscious deliberation. You didn't need to chunk. You didn't have to look for something similar in, as far as recognizable patterns. These words we automatically read, yacht, rhythm, bouquet, and fiancé, within a second of seeing them, despite the fact that they're hard to sound out. They have a regular rule-breaking patterns, right? Bouquet and fiancé. Um, they don't follow typical sound symbol spellings in English. So the words on the previous slide, like grac, required attention and a bit of strategy, a little effort. Whereas the uncommon spelling patterns in these words didn't require any attention. Interesting. Okay, last set. All right. Once again, we have back, we're back to nonsense words, and we're going to prove a point here about being deliberate and needing a strategy. So to successfully read these words, they're not sight words for you. You, I mean, you read them easily, but you had to consciously analogize them to the familiar sight words from that last slide. Bot, Pitham, Soke, and Rianse. Uh, it wasn't as quick or as automatic as their familiar counterparts, the sight words. So three of those four sets that we just saw featured nonsense words. Kishman, Poil, Bot, and Shtack. Sounds ridiculous. But obviously, when we see real words we're familiar with, they're going to be more automatic. The simulation works here, though, because... As children are learning to read over the course of many, many years, they're going to encounter many, many new and unfamiliar words almost every day. 
And to become skilled, fluent readers, they have to accumulate a large pool of words they can read by sight, just with a glance. And so to give you another thing to do so that you truly understand what we mean by sight words, look around you. Find anything to um, read, something with text, a book, a magazine, anything. And anything with writing on it. And when I say go, glance down at it and do everything in your power to suppress reading the words. Try not to read the words. Just try to even look at the page as though it's a piece of abstract art, just a design. And do not let the words enter your consciousness. Okay, ready? One, two, three, go. Could you do it? No, because sight words are so highly recognizable by the brain, so overlearned, so overlearned, that you can't suppress reading them. They, you cannot not read them. If you had just been asked to look at foreign words on a page of script in a different alphabetic code than English, or you know what we use, like Hebrew or Greek, of course, you would have been able to possibly just look at them all day long and, and not have those words pop. They're because they're not sight words for you. So this is important because the more words we have in our memories um, that are sight words, the better readers we're gonna be. Use, reading words as visual pictures can only get us so far. So those who can turn unfamiliar words into sight words using evidence-based instruction will be able to accumulate thousands and thousands more words. The question for us as instructors is, how did skilled readers like you and me get to the point where unfamiliar words can be read so effortlessly it seems we're reading them like they're just pictures? All right. Consider another amazing thing skilled readers can do. On this slide, you'll see words with typos. See how well you can read them. Well, university, representative, and anagram, right? It wasn't difficult to read these words. Just one letter was off. Reading familiar, learned words on site with a mere glance does make it seem like we're doing it visually. And reading words with typos quickly and accurately like we just did also makes it seem like we're going to read hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of words um, in books or hundreds of words a minute because we're able to read them as memorized chunks. So it seems like I didn't pay any attention to the letters or sounds, right? But you noticed these typos, didn't you? You noticed that university has something a little weird at the end with it. Um, even as you were reading them, you were able to say, I know what they are, but something's wrong. So even though we read them in less than a single second, like it was a memorized word, by, like a picture, we notice when a letter or two isn't quite right. We actually notice the letters in words. So experiments have shown that even though we're reading words instantaneously, our brains are looking at each and every letter. Um, we see the mistakes, but we can fix them and know what the word is supposed to be. And interestingly, many times, if a struggling or less skilled reader comes to a word such as this, they'll read it and not notice the typo. They'll read university and you can say, did you notice something wrong with it? No. So just a week or two, actually, well, a little longer than that ago, I was reading with a fourth grade girl. We were reading a passage about courtrooms. And for a number of years, she had just gotten by by memorizing what words like, and she wasn't using any decoding strategies or letters or sounds. Each time she came to the word trial in that passage we were reading, she said trail, because it looks like trail. So I wrote the word separately on a dry erase board, and I said, I think you're seeing the A and I together here and making it into A, like rain. But in the word trial, look, the I comes before the A. And she said, wow, I didn't see that at all. She didn't notice it at all. Her habits of reading by memorizing words how, makes it hard for her to convert words into sight words. She doesn't attend very well yet to the individual sounds and patterns because she was, her brain never learned to read that way. She learned to pay attention to the first letters in words and then depend on context to guess. So onward. Um, speaking of the word anagram that appears here, let's look at the, let's look at one on the next slide to illustrate how important paying attention to the letters is. All right, so on this slide, in this anagram on this slide, we have four letters, E, A, S, and T, and they're switched to create five different words. Uh, letter order does matter a lot if we're going to read accurately and automatically. 
So just like that girl switched to trial and trail, and we see that in kids all the time, we have to teach them to attend to the letters, have their brains do it for them. And so do make sure to watch the presentation in the series on orthographic mapping and sight words. It's going to explain a lot of this process, how the brain takes over for us and does this for us very specifically. But let's spend a um, little time on the misconceptions or beliefs regarding reading as that visual process and how instruction has aligned with these misconceptions and then how some simple experiments have done a really good job debunking this misconception. All right. One of the misconceptions right here is um, still in existence, actually. Um, it's one that has had a big influence on instruction, as you can see by the example of a worksheet often given to children. Um, and you see this on word walls and stuff all over the place. It's that skilled readers learn to read words so automatically, this is the misconception, because of their shapes. Tall letters, dangling letters, and so on, and the curves and the loops, the, the outline of the word. It's often believed that these shapes or outlines um, are physical features of a word, and that's what cues the reader to retain it as a visual thing in memory. Um, so as I mentioned at the beginning, of the presentation, a beginning reader, a novice, an early reader, that's what they have to do. And that's what struggling readers have to do because they have not learned how to use letters and sounds yet. But skilled readers, have we really memorized hundreds and thousands of words by their shapes? Um, well, of course, it's not the outline. It's, the it's not the ascending or descending letters. <clears throat> as you can see the similarities here on these words. And teaching this way reinforces in a child's mind that to read words we have to memorize what it looks like, not what the letters sound like. Imagine having to memorize all the words that look alike. No wonder so many kids come to the first letter in a word and then make a guess. And how often are they right? Not very often, actually very rarely. Um, the average English word is five or six characters long and um, to think that each of these tens of thousands of five or six letter words has its own distinctive shape is nonsense. That's by Larson, 2004. Word shape is no longer a viable model of word recognition. The bulk of scientific evidence says we recognize a word's component letters, like you did with those misspelled words, and we recognize the misspellings. And then we use the visual information to recognize a word. Okay, slide 25. Let's go on to the next one. There's my cue. We can actually take shape out of the equation altogether, and when experiments do that, we see even young beginning readers can read words in capital case, all, all printed in capital case, quickly and accurately. They can read cat, capital C-A-T, quickly and accurately. Um, if we time you when you read a list of capital, all capitalized words, you're going to be a little bit slower than if you read them regularly. But with practice, you'd be able to read the words printed in only capitals as quickly as those with lowercase. Um, I know when you get an email, all capital letters, it's kind of slower to read, isn't it? So experiments from the 1960s to 1980s were kind of clever, and they, were, they set out to disprove that visual memory misconception. Now, instead of providing words in all capital letters, Adams, actually this author here, provided participants with varying size and shape fonts to disprove word shape theories. And so college students were shown words. They were shown words printed in regularly um, spelled and then words in alternating cases, regular cases in mixed uh, fonts. And words were high frequency four letter words like down, look, and regularly spelled non words like sussed. Um, also, irregularly spelled nonce words. I don't even know how to pronounce them. Um, the results were downright surprising. Um, as they expected, the words printed normally um, were um, more easily and quickly read than those in the alternating case. That's expected. But what, what's interesting is that they got used to reading the words in the alternating case and read them as quickly as lowercase. And this was really surprising. As, a, as the participants' brains kind of acclimated to their alternating mixed up case, they actually ended up insisting that the words were all in regular, what we're used to print. 
It was an illusion because their brains no longer paid any attention to the alternating case. Um, if we use our visual memories for words, we should not be able to read alternating case words with ease. All right. So a skillful reader such as yourself, if reading words according to the shape, should have difficulty reading the following real word. Boom. Um, so how did you do? We've got a small C, a tall K. It didn't bother you a bit to read the word back printed like this because you're a skilled reader who does not rely on shape to identify a word. Your brain can accept any size, shape, font, thick, thick or thin letters to read words. Pretty cool. Okay, so doesn't bother you. And if we're reading words according to shapes, you should have difficulty reading different scripts like cursive handwriting or fancy fonts that occur on an invitation like this. But again, you don't have difficulty. It bears repeating, shape is not something that we pay any attention to as skill readers. Okay, it's not a viable explanation for how we read words. All right, all teapot and different fonts and you have no trouble reading any of those. All right, well, let's try to consider another misconception. Maybe skilled readers recognize words automatically because they just sample some of, some of the visual cues, just a few of the letters in a word, okay? So if that were the case, if skilled readers actually recognized and paid attention to individual letters, do they pay attention to all of them or just some? And this is a very, very popular, I'm sure most of you have seen this meme on the internet. And a lot of people love to use it to say, see, we don't attend perfectly to letters and sounds to read. The letters and sounds aren't important. We don't need to teach kids to pay attention to letters and sounds. Well, first of all, let's just be clear that no such research ever took place at Cambridge. This whole meme is a hoax. But as a competent, skilled reader, you were still able to read it just like you read the words with typos a number of slides back because um, its creator deliberately controlled the typos. This was done on purpose. Uh, short two or three letter function words like it and be and the help, you know, helped the grammatical structure stay intact and support you, kind of like a life vest. And they make up about half the words here. So you were able to predict and just sample the letters in longer words. But those longer words, in them, if you'll notice, only two letters in the middle were swapped. They left the first and last letters the same. None of the switches created new or confusing words. So for example, the word matter on the second line um, was changed to M-T-T-A-E-R. It wasn't changed to tamret. Also, the text had a very predictable structure to it. It does, because the words were messed up, though, but we, did, we didn't have to put cognitive energy into them at all, and context helped to relieve that burden because it was a very predict predictable sentences. Um, so if you want to learn more about this meme and why the person invented it, <laughs> go to the website here on this slide. Keep in mind that despite reading it really accurately, you would have read it more quickly if you were given a non-jumbled passage. So Rayner and colleagues did an experiment where they asked college students to read 80 sentences with switch letters and this led to lower reading speeds for most participants of course. They read 255 words per minute when the sentences were normal and only 227 words a minute when the letters were jumbled up. So subconsciously without even knowing it readers actually do attend to each and every letter in a word even if they seem they were that we're reading them as holes and effortlessly so um, even when they're not in the right order our brains can connect these mutilated spellings to what they must be um, we were just slowed down a little bit now can you imagine if you work with a uh, struggling reader or a reader with dyslexia imagine asking them to read this they would have a very very difficult time um, I wouldn't even attempt to do that and they would not be able to do it uh, they lack those sight words that allow their brain to connect the mutilated, messed up words to the correct ones. Okay. All right. So you may have gotten this sentence to correct, uh, but I bet you had to really look at the words and use the context of the previous words to help you. This messed up sentence says, a doctor has admitted to the manslaughter of a teenage cancer patient. Kind of a sick sentence, sorry. 
This passage is much more mutilated. There are longer words, more switched letters. There's less predictability in the sentence to, to fall back on. So we can't just mix up words any old way we wish and read well. The letters in that false Cambridge meme are what helped us, actually. And they didn't hurt us, they helped us. All right. When letters are only moved one or two spots, the brain can more easily make the connection to the correct word. And when they're moved a lot, um, or when more than one set are switched, it's much more difficult for our brains to say, oh, E-A-S-T, S-E-A-T, oh, that's the one it is. It's like one of those challenging jumble puzzles you see in the newspaper. So letters and sounds matter, and the brain does use them. It takes over after many experiences. It uses them to make words into sight words, words we can't not read. Okay, in case you're still not convinced, I hope you are, but in case you're not, experiments have also found that when we test people who've been found to have superior visual memory, they don't test as better readers. So, wow, you did much better on a visual memory test, you must be a better reader? No, no. Um, why not? They have not found a correlation between the two, and that's because parts of the brain, are, different parts of the brain are responsible for visual memory and for reading words. And this was first noticed by Cattell back in 1886. And he discovered that when people read printed words, they actually do reading words more quickly than showing a picture of that item and saying what that item's name is. So if they, they can, people can read the word chair better than they can look at a chair and say the word chair. And that's because um, the characteristics of chairs are it happen in a different place in the brain and it takes a different process, a little bit of a longer process than seeing a, um, something in print and reading it, which is quicker. Many other re researchers have duplicated his findings. Valente found the average time to name a picture that you look at is 872 milliseconds, but to read a word, the average time is only 560 milliseconds. So reading is, again, not a visual task. That's pretty powerful proof right there. And if you're still not convinced that reading isn't a visual task by which we retrieve whole words from memory, we have to now consider the most recent experiments. In the 1990s and 2000s, there were a lot of neuroimaging experiments done that explain response times. So these people were put into an fMRI machine and you, or other brain imaging techniques and, and given some tasks to see which parts of their brains were activated during tasks. Um, the neuroimaging that we see here backed up Cattell's um, research. Naming an object happens in an area of the brain that activates visual memory. And like when we see an object or person, to name it takes longer because we have to retrieve the name and features out of working memory. So have you ever drawn a blank? I know I have drawing, uh, trying to remember a name for something or for someone, a person. And that feeling of having the name on the tip of your tongue, it's, it's distressing. Um, try to name as quickly as you can on this next slide the people you will see. Okay, try to name them as quickly as you can. All right, did you look at any of these and draw a blank? And don't worry, at the end of the presentation I have a slide and all the names are underneath it so you'll be able to see if you are right or not. But we've all drawn a blank when we try to remember a word for something or someone's name. And so this is an issue with working memory retrieval. We see a visual item and a picture or a person and we can't recall its name. This, think about it though, this never ever happens when you look at a word. You're never gonna look at a word like airplane in print on a page and think, ah, oh, what is this? What is this word? I know it, I know it. Oh yeah, it's, it's airplane. Um, it's not that it looks familiar, I can't think of what it is. Hmm, let me think really hard. Oh yeah, it's the word girl. So there's a really good explanation for this and it's because we process the letters in words. We process the print. It happens in a specific area on the left side of our brains. And when we look at a person or an object, then we're relying on that visual memory piece. And then it can get hung up and it can get lost. So. Um, this next slide um, helps you to appreciate the very impressive and very valuable information that we've gotten from neuroimaging research. 
and the impressive tasks that our brains have to perform when we read words. We're really um, very, very fortunate to have experiments to show us how skilled readers read and other experiments that show us uh, what happens when people have difficulty. Uh, the two bodies of research all lead to the same knowledge. Reading is not visual. All right. And this slide retrieved from uh, timeinc.net. We can see how the brain converts the input, the written words, received through our visual system, our eyes, to the sounds of spoken words. So what's happening in this um, image of this girl's brain is she's looking at the word and then um, she under her brain understands that it's a representation of the sounds of our spoken language. The brain has to do a lot to make reading happen, and a lot can go wrong. Early on, a developing reader learns to associate letters with sounds, and then learns to sound out the words, and with effective instruction and experiences from repeatedly reading the same word correctly, a child can form connections that result in increasingly accurate readings of that word. Eventually, an exact replica reflecting the word's pronunciation, its spelling, the order of those letters, and even its meaning is formed in our minds so that when the child sees the word again, all the information about that word is instantly activated. How to pronounce it, how it's spelled, and what it means. And as a child becomes more and more skilled and reads more and more words accurately and rapidly, and then they'll become fluent readers. Um, children with dyslexia have different wiring in their reading systems and as a result they have to compensate by shifting to other systems such as the right hemisphere of the brain and this results in a lack of automaticity that's needed for that automatic fluent reading. They can learn to be accurate readers with systematic and explicit instruction that actually has been shown to rewire their brain so to speak. All right, the there's a joint statement from the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Academy of Opth Ophthalmology, the American Association for Pediatric Ophthalmology, and the American Association of Certi Certified Orthoptics, Orthoptists, that's a hard word for me to say, um, it's not a slight word for me. Uh, it, they, it came together, these all came together to create a joint statement discouraging educator and medical professionals and parents from recommending or seeking vision therapy for reading problems. The statement is long and it's available free online as a PDF. I have the uh, link printed here. But the beginning states that scientific evidence does not support the efficacy of eye exercises behavioral vision therapy, or special tinted filters or lenses for improving the long-term educational performance in these complex pediatric neurocognitive conditions. Diagnostic and treatment approaches that lack scientific evidence of efficacy, including eye exercises, behavioral vision therapy, or special tinted filters or lenses are not endorsed and should not be recommended. It's really and truly amazing how entrenched the misconceptions regarding reading as a visual process are. All right, as we have seen, word shape and visual memorization of words and word parts has not been support, a supported theory of word reading for a very long time, many decades. Too much evidence with these clever experiments, some of which we kind of touched on here, show that we recognize a word's component letters the order that they're in, remember trips and strip, and that we connect or map those letters to the sounds in spoken words that we have in our lexicons. So also please see the presentation on orthographic mapping and sight words so you get this um, and how this all takes place. All right, so let's not teach this way. Okay, so why devote a entire presentation in the series to this subject, that words are not recognized using visual memory. Again, there are still many instructional methods for teaching reading that have a basis in this thinking, and it's led to um, instruction that encourages teaching words as wholes. Many, many methods of doing so. There are textbooks designed for beginning reading instruction, 
that have relied on this whole word approach, especially from around 1930 to 1990, when kids' stories were constructed around high-frequency words like where and yes and can and out. And they would introduce new words and repeat them over and over and over again. It was believed if um, we repeated words over and over as whole units, then beginning readers would be able to memorize them. And yeah, it worked, so to speak. But we don't see the Dick and Jane type of books, but now we see um, predictable texts that might read like this. Look at the shirt I can wear. Look at the coat I can wear. Look at the shoes I can wear. I like the clothes I can wear. The words are repeated and the pictures match the item and the reader just needs to plug into the predictable sentence um, structure whatever picture they see um, on the page. So this discourages the child from paying attention to the letters and the sounds. Okay. Um, a popular instructional strategy for teaching reading is to provide multiple um, exposures to words so that they become memorized like their picture. Um, we have flashcards. We have texts where the words are repeated on each page over and over. We have word walls in classrooms and this is tedious and for many children not very efficient and it requires many, many, many multiple opportunities, sometimes dozens and dozens and hundreds of repetition of seeing a word. Yeah, children can learn to read words this way, but it's going to take them a long time to read the, you know, fewer words. It's cumbersome. It's not effective. It's not going to close that gap between the children who are um, taught to memorize and use their memory versus those who are taught to attend letters and sounds. All right, so this presentation's goal was to change the misconception that words are read visually, that they are something we memorize by shape or something. Um, again, review the one on orthographic mapping and sight words in the series to learn exactly what happens. Um, I hope this presentation gave you some things to think about um, when talking to other people about how reading occurs and most importantly, how reading instruction should occur. Um, to help our students become skilled readers, we have to understand the processes in skilled readers' word reading. Alrighty. Thank you so much for participating in this knowledge series. My contact information is here if you have any questions or need further information, and I hope you're going to watch the other ones in this series as well. Thank you very much.